The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. We are back in case you're wondering with George Case. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. David Hubler is in house, and I have a special guest for George and all of us. She is a returnee to the airwaves at Comfortably Zoned three or four or five times now. My buddy, Sherry Davis. How Hi, are you? guys. Oh, I'm great. It's a, it's baseball season. How how else would I? It do? is. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Very good. good morning and, and and welcome to a little discussion about baseball. Absolutely. Oh, I'm I'm happy to be here. Well, it's the end of spring training, and uh, I always think of Sherry at the end of spring training because she was the public address announcer for the Giants. Give me the years again, Sherry. You. Um, 93 to 99. Wow. The Dusty good Baker run. years there. Yeah. Very good run. And um, the um, irony is, of it is that there was an audition at Candlestick Park for said job, and I attended. Right in front of me online was Sherry Davis. She won got the job there were like how many people 500 of us uh, yeah 500 plus i think wow 500 plus people and but but um, the but the thing was there were only eight women out of those 500 only eight <laughs> that annoyed me no end because i didn't I go expecting it, to I get the it job did, you know? that's right yeah. <laughs> i went there as a fan <laughs> and how what do you contribute uh, the fact that you you won the contest? What was it? Was it well, the you know, when I when I went up there um, to audition, we only announced two names, but you'd hear ten or fifteen people, and then you'd hear someone, and you'd go, "Oh, that's a good voice." You could hear it. And when I went up there, I I had a full head of steam under me because I'd only heard one woman's voice in the hour plus I'd been sitting there waiting to audition. And she got on and she went, now batting left fielder Barry Sweet Buns Bonds. And, oh, steam was coming out of my air. So I went up there. I was ready and I announced my two batters and I got applause. I'm the only person that I heard of while I was there who got applause. And I went back to my seat and people were going, was that you? Good voice. And when I left, the guys that I've been sitting with for an hour or so in my section were chanting my number, 161, 161. <laughs> so I left there, and I, was, I really had that walking on air feeling. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I could actually do this. And I thought part of my brain was saying, oh, but your, your job, you know, your, I was a legal secretary, and I worked on a very heavy desk. And I think there's so many day games. How could I do it? And the back of my mind was, Oh, you're going to do it. <laughs> if you have to sleep in the gutter, you're going to do it. <laughs> so, yeah, did you have yeah. A, I was going to say, did you, as you left, did you have second thoughts? Wow, suppose I get this job. <laughs> oh, yes. And, yeah. and I had called in sick that morning, too, so I got totally busted for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did you manage it? How did you, how did you handle both? Because you're right, there were a lot of day it games was, in those days. There was ter- that first year. I did over 300 interviews. I worked a full-time job, and my mother died that year. Oh. So it was it was, and I had all that pressure on me that first year, you know. So did it, she get to hear you? Did she get to hear you, Sherry? No, and she didn't understand baseball at all. And one time I was back with her when the Giants were out of town. And I was answering fan letters, and she just couldn't understand that <laughs> at all. <laughs> I don't know where you get that stuff, she'd say to me. <laughs> now, we were just talking about dialects. Uh, um, David and I are from the Bronx, and we have a Bronx accent. You're a southerner with absolutely no southern accent. I've always been a Well, I, I used to talk like this. I did. 
I did. When my first day of speech class, and I'm a theater major, so I, I had it drummed out of me, but my first day in speech class in college, they went around saying M-A-N-T-A-N-S-A-N-D, man, hand, sand. I was going, man, hand. And they go, man. And I go, man. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of Pygmalion and, and my family. It was. It was just like it. And the, the my face got red. <laughs> okay. I was well, insulted. I've got something that I want to play. This is how much respect David Hubler, George Case, and I have for public address announcers. We grew up with the absolute numero uno best of public address announcers and um, I, want yes, to, I want to play this for you the best male announcer oh uh, bless was, you <laughs> right absolutely well yes and, and that was his time and this is Sherry's time so um, but here we go listen to this this is Mr. Shepard Bob Shepard in a recreation of the 1951 World Series lineup. Oh, great. Game. So um, this will give you um, some goosebumps, perhaps. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Yankee Stadium and Game 6 of the 1951 World Series, and here are the lineups. For the New York Giants, leading off <coughs> second base, number 12, Eddie Stanky, number 12. Batting second, at shortstop, number 19, Alvin Dock. Number 19. Batting third at first base. Number 25. Whitey Lockman. Number 25. Batting fourth in left field. Number 20. Monty Urban. Number 20. Batting fifth. At third base, number 23, Bobby Thompson, number 23. Batting six in right field, number 16, Hank Thompson, number 16. Batting seventh, the catcher, number nine, Wes Westrom, number nine. Batting eight, in center field, number 24, Willie Mays, number 24. Batting ninth and pitching, number 31, Dave Cutlow, number 31. And for the Yankees. Leading off at shortstop, number 10. Number 10. Batting second at second base. Number 42. Jerry Coleman. Number 42. Batting third. The catcher. Number 8. Yogi Berra. Number 8. Batting fourth in center field. Batting ninth and pick number seven, 
That bad, huh? Yeah, that was wonderful. Oh, yeah. and you, you notice how he announced both teams with the same inflection. He didn't hype one side over the other. I, I, I'm afraid those days are yes. kind of gone. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> And you know, I, a, lot I of ball, like that. a lot of ball players, was Sherry. I don't, I don't know whether you heard this, but a lot of ball players used to say it was their, one of their biggest thrills in baseball to be introduced uh, at Yankee Stadium by Bob Shepard. Well, of course, he was yeah. so stately and so so right. gracious. You know, that was the first year I actually went to Yankee Stadium. Was fifty one. I wasn't there for the World wow. Series, but I was there. And what was interesting about it? First of all, they had Willie Mays batting eighth. Which right, was I was just going to say that. Can you imagine <laughs> Willie Mays batting eighth? Yeah, I was wondering, is he not in the lineup? And, I was listening. But, was listening. but did you hear the hand they gave him? The, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Willie Mays was already a hero in New York for that. Right. But you know, it's interesting. Um, that, so that was my first introduction to Bob Shepard in 1951, and then of course I went to many, many Yankee games uh, after that. But for about uh, seven or eight years in the um, uh, the early uh, late 60s and on through the through the 70s, I didn't go back to Yankee Stadium because I was either overseas or here in D.C. And when I finally went back to a game. And I, it's still Bob Shepard. And I, I couldn't believe it was the same guy. Yeah. After like three decades, he was still there. I thought maybe it was a, re, you know, a recording that they had doctored somehow. But yeah, he was, he was terrific. Yeah. He, he gave uh, me his blessing, not in person, but they asked him about a woman announcer and he, he was totally fine with it. Bless his heart. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think I think it wasn't he also a uh, either a voice coach or a yes. diction coach or, or a professor I, or something. Yeah, yeah, he was a voice teacher. I think it was at St. John's University. Okay, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. That was his he. Life. He was very. He was always very precise with his diction and the way he announced the the players. Now that oh, was yeah. pretty much his format. Now, Sherry, did you have a similar format when you did the PA uh, at at the Giants Stadium? I. I did, but I did not announce the, their uh, numbers twice as he okay. did. Okay, right. I didn't yeah. announce it again at the end. Okay. Well, when you did the, when you were announcing, because there was a, there's a, a break as, as I mentioned for me. Um, it used to be Shepard would come on and he would give the starting lineups like we just heard, and then the only time. The first time through the lineups, he would announce them, and that would be it until there was a pitching change or a, a, a pinch hitter. Uh, he, he did not announce throughout the, the course of the nine innings. Did you announce oh all the Yeah, that's oh, true. Oh, yes. Yeah. You had every time and they there's, came there's up. An, there's an art to that, too, in the timing, and um, you have to know how the game is flowing. If you think there's going to be a pitching change, you don't announce the batter until he's almost up to the – to the box because you don't want to announce him and then have a, you know, a, a minute or so in between before he comes up again. And there's a whole art to announcing throughout the game. Well, let me ask you oh, this then. Sure. Because, because it's always been my understanding that once the batter is announced, that would be by you, he's in the game. Um, which yeah. means that if you announce someone prematurely and – they did not. He did not appear. That would be. Uh, he would be out of the game for good. Is that correct? Because he was already announced as a as as pinch hitting, let's say, and um, and he doesn't pinch hit. Well, the, I, the have, I have to be. I have to be alerted. I don't announce him until he, the umpire alerts me. Ah, okay, that's good to know. I never knew that. Well, I didn't know it either until my my second game. It was a night game, and a Mark Carrion was coming up to pinch hit. And of course, I wanted everybody there to know that I knew what was happening. So I announced him, <laughs> and the umpire turned and looked at me, and I thought, "What? What is that?" <laughs> and then next time they told me, um, "You can't announce him until we admit him." And as as it happened, there was a pitching change, and Dusty called Mark Carrion back. And sent up another pinch hitter, and Mark Carrion was out of the game. And if yeah, he had lost yeah. that game, oh my gosh, oh dear! But we, it was in the um, the bottom of the eighth that this happened. So we ended up 
winning. Thank goodness. But um, I, I never, ever, ever announced a batter. Once I did because he got all the way up. He was in the box. He was taking his swings, and the umpire had pointed at me, so I announced him very quickly right then, and the umpire turned around and looked up at me, and he, you know, batted his head like his forehead, like, <laughs> oh, he forgot. But I, I got a bad rep because I would tell this story on myself about that second game, and on talk radio it turned into – uh, she she announces batters before the umpire points at her. So I still have that reputation, even though I only did it once in my whole announcement <laughs> career. So that was that was the signal then. He point, the umpire would point to you. It was obviously you didn't have any kind of radio communication between the two. Right. So was, well, was, I always thought when he pointed back, he was pointing to alert the benches. Uh, Oops, I'm going sitting here. Let me move away from him. That he was uh, um, pointing at the benches. But no, he's pointing at the PA announcer. Ah, interesting. Okay. And that's another thing I did not know. Well, neither did I <laughs> until I... Now, Sherry, Sherry let me ask you, where, where, was your, where was your position at, at uh, Candlestick Park? Where were you? Were you up in, like in the press right. box area? or? Yes, uh, I, was, I had a separate little booth, but it was all glass, so I was in a big sliding door right to the right of the press box. Okay. So that's and so that's it, where the, the umpire that's where the, the umpire would point to you then at, in that location uh, to let you know when it was okay to announce the hitter then. Yeah, and I established a rapport with the umpires. I would always stand up when they came out and I would wave to them so they'd know exactly where I was because I'm the only right. one okay. up there, right? Yeah. So they, I, I got to know them pretty well. Right. They were really nice to me. They were really nice. Sherry, you mentioned that in a sense that Bob Shepard kind of greased the way for you a little bit by endorsing you. Who well, was who was someone that um, didn't grease the way, that wasn't happy with a female uh, as a public address announcer and made your life difficult? Well, um, I don't want to name any baseball names, but I'll tell you a politician who was rude to me. I was at spring training that I hadn't announced a game yet. It was a, I went to spring training every year. The Giants didn't send me that year. I, I had already planned to go. And um, George Will was sitting two rows behind me, and people said, oh, you ought to go introduce yourself. He's a big baseball. So I went up there, and I said, Mr. Will, and I told him who I was, and I said, um, you know, what do you think about a woman announcer? And he looked at me, and he flicked his wrist as go away, little girl. He flicked his wrist and said, it doesn't bother me, and then he turned his back on me. <laughs> yeah, that's more typical of him than you would imagine, believe me. Um, I he, said, well, I thought, well, obviously it does bother you. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't suffer fools lightly, and I don't mean you as a fool. He just That's the way he is. Yeah. He, he has such an but, inflated opinion of himself. I know. But the thing was, you never knew who was going to like and who wasn't. Um, one of my first interviews was with Pete Rose, and I thought, oh, dear Lord, they're throwing me to the wolves here. And I, the first thing I said to him, I said, Pete, I know you were a hard-nosed player. What do you think about a woman announcer? And he said, I played in Japan. I have no problem with it. The, all the announcers in Japan are women. And he was as gracious and as nice to me as he could be. And other players, other former players who are now announcers or broadcasters, who you, whom you would expect, one who was a – well, I can't go into detail because I don't want to diss him because he – I guess he's a nice man. He just has trouble with women. <laughs> but others other whom I expected that, to endorse me uh, didn't, didn't. They just – Number one, I wasn't a man, and number two, I wasn't a ball player, and so I was I didn't know anything and didn't deserve respect, I guess. Okay. Well, that soon came. You uh, eventually settled in. You had a terrific run at it, and you had fun. Tell us about your oh, road gosh. trip. <laughs> My first year... I got to go on the road trip, one road trip to um, Chicago and Milwaukee. And, you know, you get on the 
plane and there's a hierarchy on where everybody sits, uh, manager and owners or whatever, big shots in the first class and then come like the um, coaches and then the press people, which is where I sat, and the players are in the back. And, the, you know, they the hostesses make homemade cookies and, you know, you can get whatever you want to eat and you have a whole row to yourself. And it was, it was very luxurious for me. And then we got to the hotel and you pick up your envelope. It has your card for your room and the schedule. And I went to get on the ele- elevator and it was packed with giants. It was totally packed. And I just put my hand up and like, oh, I'll wait for the next one. Say, no, no, come in. So I squeezed myself in there, and the door is closed. And I went, oh God, just kill me now, <laughs> because I'll never be happier than this. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing was um, that our last night, our getaway night in Chicago, there was a big rainstorm, and we didn't think we were going to get the game in, so we would have had to play a day game the next day, and. Um, and and the Yankees actually were in town to play the White Sox. So the hotels were booked, and I'm, the team secretary was there. He says, you know, the guys are going to have to double up, and my eyes lit up. <laughs> I said, oh, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, and we'll put you with Murph, who's the clubhouse, <laughs> you know, the clubhouse guy. <laughs> the clubhouse guy who's been there forever. He's who's been eye- there forever. <laughs> Not a player. <laughs> Yeah, that's another change from the early 50s and 60s. When I went to interview Bobby Richardson, he was rooming with Tony Kubek. So, I mean, now they all have their own suite. <laughs> yes. And, you know, and on the buses they have their headsets on. It's, it, But on the plane, there was a lot. I, some of the guys, I think, were playing cards and doing stuff, you know. But, but it is more isolated now than it used to be, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, you go back to the railroad days when they used to be on trains together, you know. And they had days off from going from, say, uh, Chicago um, to St. Louis was about probably as far, well, it was as far west as they they went until expansion. So, I mean, they had a lot of good few days on the train. George would know about that. Yeah, well, what what Sherry was mentioning, David, yeah, the the train travel back in the 30s and 40s, I mean, that's how the players really bonded together, and and they, you know, they they slept in the Pullman cars and the the fact that they had their own dining cars, and and as you said, it it took a long time. St. Louis was the furthest west in in those years, Uh, but they would take a train, and it would be, you know, uh, quite a while that the players were really sitting and enjoying one another, and and a lot of the camaraderie and the friendships were developed, uh, you know, on the trains as opposed to what they do now with the with the plane travel because it's so quick, and uh, they really don't get a chance to spend much time together, you know, away from the ballpark. Right, right. And uh, there's a great George, book. It, George, it's excuse called, me one second. I just want to ask mm-hmm. George if he got to travel with his dad back in those days at all on any road trips? Well, I didn't go on the road trips, uh, but we I did take a train, I think I mentioned, with my mother and father down to spring training a couple of times. So, but I was with them. I was not actually, you know, with the ball club because the ball club was pretty much, I was only five or six years old. So, you know, I wouldn't go with them on a, on a road trip, but I did, you know, go with my parents many times on, on trains going to spring training. I have to bring up that I, I took a train trip across country before I ever got the job to visit ballparks. And across the southern route, uh, they, I, I couldn't get a paper. I, I had this inflated idea that there'd be papers and everything on the train. It was much more bare bones than that. But they said to go to a porter. He was a Giants fan. And he said, have you met the conductor? Well, I ended up sitting with the conductor all the way across Louisiana and Texas, and the conductor was Rags Guidry, Ron Guidry's Cajun father from Lafayette. <laughs> <laughs> we talked, we talked Cajun stuff, and we talked baseball the whole way across right. that 
long. Well, that was <laughs> that was quite an interesting experience for you there, Sherry. That's for sure. Oh, it was wonderful. He was the dearest man. Right. right. <laughs> Which park struck you as being your favorite when you went across the country? Oh, I Wrigley is still my favorite. The friendly confines. You're so close to the action there. But my heart was pounding when I went into Fenway, you know. It was just, that's a magnificent place. But but for friendliness and for the fans and the knowledge of the fans, uh, I, I'll still take Wrigley, I think. Beautiful. Um, if you weren't a Giant fan, what fan would you be? Probably a Cubs fan because of Wrigley Field and because the fans are just so darn dedicated to them through so many losing seasons. Okay. And, I, and I, I just I, love I've it. always wanted to ask you this, Sherry, because you and I, we talk baseball. You are not just a woman who likes baseball. You're a person who knows baseball and loves baseball. What would you do if baseball – if you grew up and baseball wasn't baseball, what would your passion be? Well, I didn't have it growing up. I didn't discover baseball till 1980, but I fell very hard for it. And I read every day, and I listened to Hank Greenwald on my headset, and I read all the baseball books and and novels and everything. I grew up with ballet and theater and piano and Sports were in the South were just some kind of lower, <laughs> lower echelon there that I What's wasn't bothering my pretty head about. I mean, a great, a great artist and a great baseball player. Well, I I went saw a ballet that was based on baseball, and it it was not nearly as athletic or poetic as a great double play to me. Um, I think they're very much connected in in the spontaneity and the dedication and the beauty, the beauty of that the field itself and of, and of the grace of the players. Um, I think they're very much connected, and, and the spectacle uh, and the cheering, and I, I I find them intertwined in my life. Let me just tell you what a great fan Sherry is. What's the name of your cat, Sherry Davis? <laughs> when I go to the vet and they call out for my cat, they ask for Chili Davis. <laughs> 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 and I always chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big orange cat, too. <laughs> Chili got a new job this year, and I can't – it escapes me what it is, but uh, I think he's the batting coach of Minnesota, if I'm not mistaken, or Cleveland. I don't I don't know. But Chili is a renowned uh, instructor in baseball. He's oh, I – Having a I know. terrific career over, over the years. He did better after he left the Giants. Oh, he he did really well his whole career. Yeah, true, true, but uh, even better, let's say, after he left the Giants. Yes. Yeah. Sure, well, sure, can, can I ask you one thing? Can I ask you one thing? I heard you mention the name uh, Hank Greenwald. Oh, yes. Okay, I, the reason I, I picked it up, because Hank, my dad was managing the Hawaii Islanders in 65 and 66, and Hank, and I didn't realize it, but he told me, that he was the broadcaster in 66. Uh, oh he had God. followed Harry Callis, and then uh, Hank was doing the Islanders broadcasting when my dad was managing there. Oh, my oh. gosh. That's wonderful. I love Hank Greenwald. Yep. He he had such a, a dry wit and a self-deprecating humor and uh, just totally delightful. And right. his son is good as well. I keep hoping he's going to make it to the majors. He's with um, – Triple A. Oh, is that right? Okay. Years. Yeah. And had, 
Well, well, I wanted to ask you because I heard you mention his name, and I just wanted to, you know, let you know that that I knew who that person was because uh, I wouldn't have known if he hadn't contacted me on Facebook one time a couple of years ago. He said, "Hey, George, by oh. the way," he said, "I just wanted to tell you, you know, I was in the broadcast booth out in Hawaii when your dad was managing, so it was uh, nice to hear from him." Wonderful man. That doesn't right. surprise me that he reached out to you. Yep. And it yeah. doesn't surprise me that he remembers your dad speaking of reputations, George. Um, we spoke with Al Clark, and I spoke with him off the air, and he mentioned something that is really interesting. Your dad was a AAA manager all the all those years, but his reputation as an instructor grew in the final years of his career when he was managing um, Oneonta. He was up in Oneonta, New York, right, as the Oneonta, short season New in New York Ten League. A yeah. break-in league. And I've always said that coaches who uh, coach the kids that are coming out of college and high school, breaking in to, the, to organized ball, should be making the most money of the coaches in the organization because they set the tone for establishing a work ethic and how you go about business with these players right from the start. And he, uh, as Al said to me, really um, increased his reputation once he started managing. In well, you know, I, I appreciate that, uh, Ralph and, and Sherry and David. Uh, you know, th that was just what my dad liked to do. And there's a lot of people in baseball, as Sherry knows, I mean, in all different capacities. But my dad was, uh, you know, had been a coach and a manager at the, you know, at a certain level. But then when he uh, worked with the Yankees, uh, they wanted him to, to move up in the organization. But they said to him, they said, George, you're so valuable to us you know, coaching these, these youngsters that, that we want you to stay there. And he was there for four years, and that's what he really loved to do. He loved to, to work with these kids coming right out of college and teach them a little bit, not so much about baseball, but just about how to live their life and, and handle themselves professionally. So he, he really enjoyed that. And, you know, uh, down at the low, low levels, the, the families that take them in oftentimes – act as counselors as well, you know. Yes, the they would. You're and absolutely they'll, right. They'll be yeah. upset. And I know one Nettie, this wonderful old grandmotherly type, uh, would say to the kid, the boys, uh, well, if they didn't want you, you'd be gone. So just fuck up and, you know, go back in there. You know, it, it, what's done in the minor leagues is, is very heartening. It's, it, it helps them become people as well as players, I think. No, it sure does. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it certainly helps with players coming in from different countries who – biggest adjustment, and it was it was the same when Minnie Minoso and those guys uh, were coming in, is it's a new language, it's a new culture, and if you have people around you, they can help get you through it. It really helps. Um, they have it tough. They have it really tough. Have you seen the movie Sugar? No. I highly recommend it. It's about it's fictional, but it's about, it's about a player coming from uh, the Dominican, I believe, and going someplace in the Midwest where nobody speaks the language, and it follows him for a year or so. And it's it's a really lovely, almost documentary style of, of movie. Sugar. Hmm. I highly recommend I remember. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll look for that. Um, there's also a book about Tahada, the shortstop with the A's. And I can't think of either his first name or... Uh, Miguel. Miguel. Miguel Tahada. Terrific yeah. ball player. And um, there's a book that documents what happens when a kid is signed and he comes over. Um, the idea of you can't walk your way off the island... These guys come from impoverished situations, and they have a different attitude about the game. They, it's joyous to them. 
Uh, well, you know, some of those kids actually, because uh, I, I did a, I, uh, an article for Islands Magazine about baseball in the Dominican Republic. It won an award. And some of those kids actually start, they don't even have the money to buy a glove. They play with, like, cardboard on their hands as a glove. I mean, you talk about, yeah, impoverished, yes. It's, 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 uh, it's just the other side of the island is even more impoverished than the Dominican Republic is when it comes to uh, the low level. But, the, but they do love, they love the game so much. Um, uh, one of these days I'll, I can, I'll fill you in on some of the stories from down there, but uh, this isn't it. But the point is, yeah, they are, the, the kids love the game. Um, and they'll do anything to play the game, and they'll, uh, and um, and now the, now that the major leagues have caught on to this, they've all established academies down there. Uh, Toronto was one of the first, and uh, they teach the kids. You know, they try to get them to learn a bit of English, um, and so it's not just playing on the field. They give them this sort of uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, a, a primer on what it's like in the United States and how to behave and how to try to speak English and things like that. Absolutely. George, did your dad play winter ball? He didn't play. He didn't play winter ball. He he uh, coached winter ball a couple years. And uh, matter of fact, uh, I have a I have a photograph when my dad in '65 went to Japan to teach. Uh, American baseball to to the Japanese uh, in uh, Japanese Central League, and that fall or that winter, the Japanese responded and sent four or five player of their players over to the Washington uh, Winter League Club to work with my dad because they learned so much about baseball from him, and he was flattered that uh, you know that they would do that. So uh, that was his experience in winter ball. A couple of years as uh, you know managing the the Washington Ball Club in winter ball. Oh, now, fascinating. Did he speak Spanish? <laughs> he learned to speak, I think, a few words, but, you know, they communicated, uh, as I've mentioned before, you know, baseball is a pretty much of a universal language. So they, they would, you know, they would know positioning and they would know situations and that kind of thing. But, but the language, I know when my dad was playing, uh, in in Washington in the 30s and 40s, they actually had some uh, you know quite a few Cubans because the Cuban connection to Washington was very strong. That's right. Uh, yeah. But they had uh, you know they would have somebody on the bench who who actually would help uh, who knew who was bilingual and help the communication between the you know the Latins and the and the American ball players. So but it was funny listening to Sherry talking about. Southern accent. My dad developed a little bit of a southern accent because so many of the ball players were from the south. So I, I could pick up, I could pick up his accent once in a while. I used to tell him, I said, Dad, you're, you're talking south again. He just laughed. He said, Yeah. He said, You know, that sort of happens because you're surrounded by, you know, so many good friends and ball players, you know, from the south. It's well, I drop into that crawl. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an easy, it's an easy dialect to pick up. Right. I was watching. You talk about language. I was watching the interview uh, uh, Tanaka yesterday after uh, the other day after he pitched about six, seven good innings, and uh, he was. They were, the, his translator was right there, and then all the questions went to him, and then he went back. But on the last question, when she asked him, he said, "Well, are you ready?" He smiled, and then he says, "I'm ready in English." <laughs> <laughs> What, what was it, the uh, uh, Ralph and, and Dave, you remember, I think it was last year, I mean, last week, uh, Al Clark was telling the story about Sammy Sosa when he was, you know, testifying, and he kept saying, no comprende, no comprende. Yeah. And, and Al said, that was just his act. He said he knew English as well as anybody. <laughs> right. Uh, and he knew a lot of things. He knew corked bats. It's <laughs> Sammy Sosa. Um, Sherry, what made you what what made you give it up? I mean, you you certainly, but yeah. Oh, I uh, did. I didn't totally give qualified. it up. Oh, I didn't give it up. They they wanted when they moved to the new ballpark, they wanted an AM DJ voice, so they got an AM DJ. They wanted uh, that roller coaster, whip up the crowd. You know, at oh, yeah, yeah. I would never have to tell the crowd to make some noise. They knew right. what oh, they did. So, and they wanted a cheerleader, and that I was. 
between that and Bob Shepard, I was somewhere in, in the middle and more towards a Bob Shepard type. And that's not what's popular these days. And they were going for the dot com crowd and yeah, they wanted right. a cheerleader. Uh, so. Yeah, it's terrible. Well, you know, we've, we've talked about that. Sherry, we've stuff. talked about that, and David and Ralph, yeah. we talked about that with Al Clark. I mean, it, it has changed, and and the, the fans today, you know, they go, they want to be entertained, and you got to go through all that that craziness, the the mascots and the and the cheer, you know, to being told when to clap and when to holler and and stand yeah. up and kiss camera and all that kind of stuff. Where in the old days, you never had to do that, as you know, Sherry. I mean, you were yeah. announcing or doing the PA, and that was it. That was your responsibility you weren't there trying to get the crowd on their feet i mean you were trying to broadcast no. the game because the game was what was important that was the entertainment Absolutely. today it's the other way around yep i know right. you don't have a moment's pe- you don't have a moment's peace in today's game you know right. it used to be right. you could sit there and talk to your neighbor and have a leisurely calm relatively calm afternoon right. and now it's it's all short attention span theater going on you know yep Absolutely. You know, for people that follow cricket, um, that's one of the great pleasures of the afternoon, sitting out on the lawn yeah. and watching this very – if you think baseball is slow, you can watch cricket <laughs> <laughs> and, and watch this slowly develop, you know, and, and, and it's so relaxing. Um, if you ever want to see a good movie about that, Sherry – mm-hmm. get a hold of The Go-Between, a wonderful movie. Uh, okay. It's taken from the novel by the same name. And uh, that's how baseball was. You'd come out into this wonderful opening green area, and you'd sit down and you'd you'd be entertained for two two, two and a half hours of wonderful baseball. And now, George is right. I mean, I just can't stand. uh, We have a president's race here in Washington in the fourth inning, and more people are more interested in whether George Washington will beat Abraham Lincoln uh, than they are in which, you know, will will the Nationals beat whoever they're playing that day. You know, I auditioned for the Nationals PA job. Oh. Really? Yeah, I did. Yeah. But, you know, again, is I think you wanted more is this height. through your experience here? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, it's true, Sherry. They wanted more height. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they do. They do. Because they don't just announce the player's name. Um, yeah. It's the way he's announced. Uh, you oh, know, yeah. Uh, um, it's like several... soccer. Yeah. It is. Or, ba- yeah or basketball. Right. Or basketball. You know, it is. It's well, basketball. Voice. One of the beauties of basketball is I don't do too much announcing because the game <laughs> moves so fast. Hockey too, but um, but I I just find it so irritating and annoying. Um, the the players. Well, let's go. Let's own. go back to the the pastoral game. You know. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> well, I wish I wish we, sound, we would. You know, we I sound think, like old fogies. <laughs> yeah. No, well, well, well we you know we we talked about that too, Sherry. We are old people, and, and the fact is that you know. We're traditionalists, and we like the way the game yes. used to be. It, it's not not the way the game has become. That's for sure. Oh, we're not even going to talk about putting a player on second base. No, no, don't talk about that. Oh, that. No, oh, that, okay. That, that that infuriates that infuriates all of us. That will. And maybe they should have a maybe they should have the batter hit off a tee. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, picture says I've got a sore arm. You just take it off the tee today. Right. I mean, yeah. It's just it's absurd what they're trying to do the game. And oh, I've said before, terrible. just leave leave the game alone. They keep tinkering with it, and it, you know, it's just not the same. And just you know, this this rule about this thing at second base, I hope it doesn't go into the major leagues because it just uh, ruins the whole integrity of the game when that happens. Bring- I mean. Bring baseball is baseball. The guy gets the second base on his own. That's that's fine. And if he scores on his own, that's fine. But you don't put a you don't put a guy on second base and and, and say, hey, he's going to score, and that's going to be the end because the the game you know is going to be over after the tenth inning or eleventh inning or whatever it is. That, that's that's nonsense. Right. Right. Well, the same. you know, I I I brag about staying for an eighteen inning game. You know, when I was right. just a fan. Right. <laughs> 
That's what right. baseball is. I mean, one of our Absolutely. one of our you know guys, Hal Bach, Hal Bach, always talks about. It. You know, baseball doesn't have a clock. the the other right. The other sports have clocks. Baseball doesn't. So that the game right. goes to be twelve, thirteen, fourteen, eighteen innings, whatever it is, until you get a winner. That, that's what it is. It's not an artificial ending to a game, which putting a runner on second base. That's what it would be. No, and those are always exciting games. On balls. You know, you know, they even have the yeah. regular base, uh, base on balls. Uh, 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 you know, the um, yeah, they just pass the, the guy. They the intentional walk. They, they just say, "Hey, go ahead, head. take it." I yeah. mean, you know, you you remove the drama of maybe a guy throwing a wild pitch or or a guy, you know, grooving one, and all of a sudden the batter hits one out. And I mean, that's, that's right. a different situation. It could that's happen. That's right. Yeah. And and it doesn't it doesn't detract from the length of the game by any stretch of the imagination. Right. You're talking I know. milliseconds. Yep. Uh, if you want to distract, if you want to make the game a little bit shorter, you could eliminate the twelve commercials in between. <laughs> right. Yeah. That would yeah. Hurt my feelings. And fifteen commercials during the playoffs. Yeah, they they put oh, them yeah. in blocks. I think like thirty seconds or something. So you're seeing about ten or twelve commercials within a a couple of minutes, and that certainly does lengthen the game because you got commercials running all the time. You know, yeah. <laughs> when I would watch a game, uh, an away game with friends, and I'd I'd click off when the commercials came on and look at something else, and I click back exactly when it started. It, it was ingrained in me how much time there was between <laughs> innings. Right. Right. Yeah. Was and I was part of the response. speed up. I was part of the speed up the game thing when um, Frank Robinson was in charge of that, and it didn't matter if I announced a batter at the two minutes and fifteen seconds or whatever it was. It didn't mean that batter was going to run up there and get at the box. It didn't mean that the pitcher was going to stop throwing his warm-up pitchers. Unless the umpires enforce it, they're not going to listen to a PA announcer. They don't even care. They don't listen to me. So that was – and it threw off sure, my timing. It was awful. Music. They didn't – Individual players didn't have their own music to bring them up. Yeah, walk up the walk-up music. Up to music. stroll yeah. up there. Uh. To stroll. <laughs> Make hey, them all Jerry, have peppy warm-up music so they walk up faster. <laughs> would you do two yeah. things? Befriend these two gentlemen on Facebook so that you can have the pleasure of their company and their the ple- and then the pleasure of yours. And oh, absolutely. And promise us you'll come back and uh, share more time with us. I will, and I want a copy of that article that you spoke of, the award-winning article. Oh, I'll, uh, yeah, I, Latin I, American I, I have a link to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, I'd like to read that as well. As if you, would I, as would I, David Hubler. Uh, okay, uh, do you want to give me your email address uh, over this, or do you want to no, wait? I'll still friends you on Facebook, and you can you can. Oh. Okay. Do it through there. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I don't want to give out my. On no, the I air. understand. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, right. After we talk the air, I'll no, give it to you. Yeah, yeah. You'll wind up, <laughs> you'll wind up in one of those uh, think yeah, tanks in Britain or something. You know. Yeah, right. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, I I still get you know nasty. Every so often, I'll get a nasty thing on Facebook. I haven't announced in twenty years or so, and someone will find me and say, uh, rah, 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 and call me names it's, it's amazing it's amazing well, guys have a long memory your good names too do you know sherry has a display at the hall of fame no i, I was up there a year and a half ago i don't recall it's in the, the women's section diamond dreams oh oh yeah we were there for well that's I'm great because i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to look for that next time i go up there that's wonderful sherry yeah. that's, that's a very nice honor Oh, Again, I have a picture. First, woman, and, and first female public address announcer in baseball history. That's great. Wow. Yep. In, actually, in any major sport in the country. Yeah. Really? That's, yeah. did not know that. I didn't know there were other major sports besides baseball. <laughs> <laughs> good one, Ralph. That's a good the one. Lesser, like that. The lesser yeah. sport. <laughs> the fillers. The fillers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. This has been tremendous. Um, I'm going to push a button, get us off, 
and you guys can chat off the air and exchange information. I want to thank everybody for listening. The show is, in case you're wondering, with George. The network is the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And um, if you like our offerings, even if you don't like them so much, box up some lightly used children's books. And if you'd be so kind, take them to the Head Start program wherever you live. Kids need to read, they need to develop a passion, and they need to become school-ready, get their noses out of the devices, and read a book. So if you'll do that, we're appreciative. I know I am. And um, please come back next week. I thank you for listening. Enjoy it, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Yeah, Sherry. Now you can, I, yeah, if you want to give.